Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we are talking about such a great hot topic. We came across a Tim Shanahan blog, I guess a few weeks ago now, and it addressed teaching comprehension skills and strategies, and it really led us to today's guest. Yeah, so today we have Peter Afflerback, who is a professor of reading at the University of Maryland. And he'll talk to us uh, first about the difference between skills and strategies, but then we'll get more into like, what else? It can't just be skills and strategies we teach. So we'll get into the nitty gritty. Great. Yeah. Well, welcome, Peter. Hi, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. Well, there's there's so much confusion around the terms skills and strategies, likely because they seem to be used interchangeably. And I'm sure there are many other reasons, but that's the one that we'll bring up right now. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. Oh, I was just, I, I picked out a quote from your, from the article that we, we found of yours. We, we went down okay. rabbit holes around skills and strategies. Yeah. And you said there's a lack of consistency in the use of terms, skill and strategy, reflecting an underlying confusion about how these terms are conceptualized. Um, so can I, I would love to, for you to just talk about that confusion. Like, why do we get so confused? Oh, sure, terms? sure. Yeah, and I I believe um, the article you're referring to is it's from the reading teacher, and it's uh, yeah. I think it's now like 15 years old. So I know it's been out there for a while. <laughs> and a little bit of like the genesis of that um, thought piece, um, David Pearson and I used to do um, these tandem presentations at IRA, which then turned into ILA when they used to have annual conventions. And we, in a discussion, you know, focused on the idea that there really does seem to be a, a massive level of confusion around strategy and skill. So we did a, uh, we might call it a seat of the pants investigation, mm -hmm. um, prior to getting into some theoretical issues related to strategies and skills. So we, we, uh, you know, did an informal survey of our colleagues, of our undergraduate elementary education major students and our graduate students. And we said, you know, what are skills? What are strategies? And how are they related? And 10 people would give us 10 different answers. They were all kind of related, but all different. And, um, you know, one view is it's it's okay as long as people teach well and students learn, but might there be a benefit to clarifying what a strategy is and what a skill is? And so we um, we looked at the literature and we um, looked at our own research work. And David um, Pearson's done loads of work with uh, reading comprehension strategy and reading comprehension instruction and you know zones of proximal development and gradual release of responsibility, which are really wonderful frameworks for us to think about reading strategy instruction. And uh, David and I were doing this presentation, I think it was in San Antonio um, at IRA and Scott Paris, who's a colleague from, was at the University of Michigan, was in the audience. And he came up to us afterwards and I, we might have had a beer or, or something <laughs> after the talk. And we said, let's, let's, you know, let's put our heads together and try to um, sort this out and offer our ideas to, um, in this case, the reading teacher, which we think is such a good um, way to connect with classroom instruction and, and the, all the wonderful teachers who provide it. And so we, um, we re reviewed the literature and our own research and theories, and it, it seemed to evolve. It evolved into this idea that when we talk about skillful reading, we often talk about um, readers who are strategic, but who are using strategies that have been so practiced and mastered that um, they become automatic in applying the strategies. And when something is automatic, um, and we define that as not requiring any working memory uh, attention mm -hmm. and not not really demanding much cognitive resource on the reader's part, one of the reasons that we want our students to develop into skillful readers is because then as they read and comprehend text, hopefully, they can, they can do things with what they're reading. You know, it's so that part of our idea was we don't want kids to uh, read only to answer teachers' questions about 
comprehending text, but we want kids to be able to read and then, um, you know, read crit critically, evaluate authors, evaluate arguments, um, be able to distinguish fact from opinion and look at claim evidence structures and things like that. And if all of our working memory is taken up with strategies because their strategies are mindful as opposed to skills, which are so practiced that we don't have to pay much attention to them. And when we don't have to pay much attention to something, it frees up thinking space or, or workspace so that kids can do these higher order thinking and tasks related to the reading that we ask them to do. So we, uh, you know, we came up with this idea that um, when we're teaching reading, and I, I prefer to use the term teaching readers, when it comes to comprehension strategies and also metacognition strategies, wh where we teach kids how to um, plan and then monitor and then evaluate their progress across the course of reading a text or texts that um, strategies are where we want to be because as strategies are uh, resource demanding, they're also, um, we, we could say we can deconstruct them. For example, a prediction strategy. If you look at the literature on how accomplished readers start reading, they'll, you know, they'll often look at the title of a text, they'll look at the first paragraph, a topic sentence, and it, it helps build a sort of an anticipatory schema or frame for reading the rest of the text. And those sorts of things are really um, good for teachers to model. And so when we're teaching, we focus on the strategy. So with prediction, it might, you know, it, we might think about a big book or um, a shared reading in first or second grade where the teacher is holding up the book. And it's like, look at this. It says all about fish. What do you think this is going to be about? And most kids will say it's, it's going to be about fish. But, you know, as, as we get more and more um, focused and specific with our strategy instruction, we can point out things like topic sentences and what do authors use to signal what we can then base a prediction on. And so through practice, the, the idea is that children will get more and more proficient at the strategies that they use and that these strategies will eventually become automatic. So, so that when you or I pick up a text, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of automatic that we build this anticipatory framework because we're so practiced and we're so accomplished at our reading. That, and that's what, where we want to get our kids to get to. Um, and so it's the strategy part is how do we think about instructing readers and how do we think about building their um, toolkit of reading comprehension strategies? And so the strategy is the, um, the mindful step-by-step uh, -step thing that we really want to bring to kids' attention, that we want to model, that we want to explain, that we want to think aloud about so the kids build these strategy routines into their heads. And, you know, the, the idea with, uh, for example, gradual release of responsibility is that that external model that we provide about how a strategy works and the steps in a strategy will eventually become internalized by the student. And the, as the teacher pulls back in the responsibility, the student builds that responsibility. And I think that's a that, that GRR, Gradual Re Release of Responsibility Model, is just a really handy way of thinking about um, the handoff that teachers make to students if instruction is working and students are learning well, these reading strategies. And so, if it, you know, we imagine teaching these strategies like uh, early, middle, elementary school, um, and then students are regularly practicing them. Students will always be strategic but their, their strategies will become over-practiced and mastered so that they are applied skillfully and their, their skills. They're, they're not a thing that, that a student necessarily has to pay attention to unless it's not working. Um, but, but part of our accomplished reading experience is all around the fact that we choose to use specific strategies. We, we most often use them successfully and we don't have to pay that much attention to them. It's, it's really one of the, uh, I think the wonderful things about how reading works for the student who is reading well. The, the, the counter to that would be how much the struggling student has to do to try to manage even a, a small strategy. And, and then, you know, what do we do, um, 
for a student who's not getting it in the first or second try. And um, I don't I don't think there's an argument to move away from the gradual release of responsibility, but we know that the kids uptake of, of learning strategies is going to vary based on, uh, you know, their general language experience, the the suitability of the text and the topic for being a place where we try to teach reading comprehension strategies and things like that. So I've been babbling nonstop here. I, I don't know. I, I hope oh, I hope I gave you something interesting. So <laughs> yes, we, have, yeah. we do have lots I mean, of questions. I'd love to unpack some of some of that okay. for sure. Okay. Do you want to start, Lori? Yeah. Um, well, I first I feel like I'm having like a little moment of like an aha moment. Uh, Peter, do all strategies want to be skills? Is that what you're saying? Well, it's um, not necessarily, but okay. if, if we think about <laughs> the, the student's reading development, like a elementary school to middle school to high school, uh, curricula are structured um, with the assumption that kids are going to be becoming more and more proficient in reading every grade. And therefore, we can give them more complex texts. We can ask them to play one text off another. We can ask them to compare authors' viewpoints. In history, we can ask them to see if um, how would they determine which text is more trustworthy in a history class? And in in science, we want kids to be able to um, designate what a claim is and what evidence is, if the evidence is provided near a claim. And um, as, as quickly as we can move kids to skillful um, use of, of that approach to reading, which is actually strategies working at a very efficient and fast pace, the, the better it is for, for what lies ahead of each student, which is more and more reading, more and more complex tasks related to the reading that they do. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, accomplished readers really never lose uh, the fact to be strategic if they have to. And um, w one of the things that I've been doing, I mean, this is I think whenever I say this, I'm getting pretty old. Uh, I started doing this in about 19, uh, in the 1980s. I would give really challenging pr uh, paragraphs to really good readers. And the, the, the topics of these paragraphs and all the markers like subheadings and titles were taken out of these paragraphs. And what it did was it broke down um, the reading of, of what are usually very skillful, automatic um, readers to basic strategies. And, you know, so the paragraphs that I use in my research and have used in my research, I think are, are really great um, prompts for seeing how strategic we can be if we have to be. And, you know, I think anyone listening to this podcast might, uh, you know, try to recall a recently challenging text um, and how, you know, things slow down when things become challenging and they, they become more um, accessible to our thought that we can become more conscious about what it is that we do as readers. And, and I always think that that's valuable in, in one, because it helps us appreciate how amazing an act of successful reading is, you know, all the things that have to be coordinated, you know, way, way down from word recognition, which, um, and, and, you know, by the way, like phonics is, is a good example of a strategy that turns into a skill, you know, mm -hmm. because, a kid who doesn't know what a CL blend says has to learn that and has to be able to recognize the CL and has to um, relate it to that known in, in memory. And, but eventually we want kids to be extremely fast at that. And then as they read and read and read, um, you know, like it's, it's kind of rare for an adult of, of our age, I shouldn't say our age, my age or your younger ages to, <laughs> um, you know, to stumble across words unless they never really mastered them in the in the first case um and but but also um th the fact of being a strategic reader i think is something that can always be appreciated by a reader and um you know like you step back and like i well that was a tough editorial or um y y i I, I guess almost everyone in the world goes to Ikea at some point in their <laughs> life, you know, and, and it, this is kind of a nonverbal example of strategies, but you know, like when you finally figure out what those pictures mean, when you're trying to assemble <laughs> something that has 1002 pieces, you know, you've, you've developed a strategy for reading visuals and, you know, that connects with what our students are increasingly 
um, encountering in classrooms, which is multimodal texts and uh, graphs embedded in internet pages and then little videos. And, you know, how do, how do those strategies work? And I, I, as an aside, I think that's one of our uh, really interesting places to be going forward that the strategies we use in what we might call traditional text are um, real applicable in internet reading, but there's also this new type of strategy, which is how do you, how do you take things and, and mix them and conjoin them and synthesize them uh, when you're confronted with all of them at the same time. And, and that, that's, that veers into, again, this, the idea of metacognitive strategies and, and how we manage our resources. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up. It's so funny. Lori and I were talking about this earlier, trying to sort out for ourselves what's a skill and a strategy. <laughs> and I you know she brought up, we, we actually talked about predictions and she was saying how her 11 year old was actually struggling a little bit with giving a good prediction from this text. You know, she said something, but it was like not really based on anything. And, and I was like, yeah, but like my four year old makes predictions about like, you know, he'll, I'm reading aloud and he'll say like, Oh, I think this is what's going to happen. You know, like, and, yeah, and it's like, yeah. I, I love what you said just about, you know, it's, it is about the reader and, and the text too, right? It's, it's right. not like we can just say, okay, we taught a strategy, we're done. <laughs> now it should be a skill, right. but there's so much going on with, you know, what are they reading? What are the, the students bringing to that text and what strategy sure. might they need? So I'm just, I'm glad that you brought that up. And do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah, well, um, you know, of course, like I think our most uh, effective instruction happens when we um, we're working with students have a, a, at least a considerable base of knowledge for what they're reading, and the the boost that prior knowledge gives to our strategy use, excuse me, is considerable in a lot of cases. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're, you've read some of the literature uh, coming out in the last five or 10 years where people sound, seem to downplay reading strategy instruction and say it, it's really all about content knowledge. And um, I, I, I get that in that um, if kids are working in a rich, rich uh, area of prior knowledge, like if you get a kid in fourth grade who knows everything about dinosaurs, and, and you want to teach um, any type of reading strategy, um, again, to go back to that working memory and cognitive load idea, if if the child has a mental library of every type of dinosaur, Jurassic, you know, Precambrian, Cret Cretaceous, whatever, um, that's one less thing that that student has to be concerned with while building meaning and being strategic in building meaning. But um, I, I've read stuff where people are advocating for um, pulling back on reading strategy instruction. And I, I think that's really wrong. Um, and because as far as I can tell, the argument those folks make is, well, if kids have lots of prior knowledge, um, that, you know, that, that's where reading really gets good. But when I visit classrooms, um, I think this is still true. Reading is still the vehicle for kids to learn most of the content. And, and so, Th those things don't dovetail very well. If you're saying, well, kids just need to have lots of content to be good readers. Um, but that's the point of them being in school to get new content. So I think a good middle ground is thinking about reading strategy instruction in the places where children have at least a, uh, a good level of prior knowledge, because um, then you can not only teach more sophisticated reading strategies, but their um, their cognitive load is not going to be pulled in one direction. Like I don't even know anything about dinosaurs, or plus I don't know what this reading strategy is. Those that does not sound like a recipe for success. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that you brought this up. It's something that Melissa and I talk about all the time. That there is this. Uh, space happening right now where folks are saying it's, it's one or the other and it's, you know, it's either or. And yeah, that's it, it, crazy. It, yeah. Yeah. It's like both and right. You have to have both in order to be effective there. Yeah. 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 And I guess I'll, I don't want to sound too snarky, but um, I mean, some of the people who advocate that approach, just like, it's just about knowledge rather than strategies. Um, I don't think they know the research, you know, so <laughs> I, yeah. I would not give I actually, much credence to, to that. Yeah, I think knowledge is, has been such an, an underserved topic in reading science that I, I do see the value of bringing it to the forefront. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree that it's 
important to not forget about that we need our strategies to access that knowledge. And you're right that a lot right. of the ways that we're doing that in classrooms is through reading, is through text. So we have to have our strategies right. to do that. Such a good point. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think you just get into a sort of a mental cul-de-sac if you follow that logic that you're, okay, so kids need knowledge to gain knowledge. Well, that's why we help them learn reading strategies to become skillful readers so they can then learn that content on their own. But embedding our reading strategy instruction in content areas that are meaningful and motivating to kids is, is of course, uh, important. So I, I think there's a, I don't know if it's a middle ground, but it's uh, it's not either extreme that's, that's going to be most successful for students. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I think Lori and I talk about this a lot, that we we were on the other end of the extreme when we were teaching, which was, I, I didn't, even, we didn't even think about knowledge, to be honest with you. And we didn't, uh, the way we did it was teaching these strategies in right. isolation. Like, I mean, we right. were like, here's a week of making predictions and what the text was right didn't even matter <laughs> you know and yeah and that's where we we advocate for like yes you want of course you want to teach these strategies but you also want to do it with a text that they're going to get something from it you know you want them to right. gain some knowledge from what they're reading <laughs> yeah well and it it um you know that that middle ground does a better job of putting the student in a position of strength as opposed to you know like just treading water in both the knowledge and the strategy um columns. So. Yeah. Can you elaborate as to why, like why it puts the student in a stronger position? Yeah. Well, um, you know, the, the part of how our brains function is like we, um, the way that we store knowledge is you could call it schema or scripts or frames. And, uh, the, the brain is, is, is pretty darn efficient in organizing information in associative networks, you know, like, so like, and you can play a game. Like when I say orange, what do you think about? Do you think the color or the fruit? But that's most people will think about one of those things first, or they might <laughs> think about the orange fruit, but, you know, and so then they can go to gifted and talented, but um, you know, it's um, it's more that um, that having that store of knowledge at hand while you're you're trying to do sophisticated reading strategy development is is just um it's it's a it's a real resource for kids it's a re real resource for adults um our our best reading happens when we do have this base of knowledge that can feed our um our questioning of the author that can feed our elaborating on what the author has provided and um it also helps in remembering because if you have a schema for the civil war or the revolutionary war or imports from tanzania or in an ancient egyptian culture when you read and get new information using your strategies you have a place to put that new information and it's you know it gets bound to that existing base um, if you don't have that existing base you, you're your brain's working overtime to try to learn the strategy, use the strategy, and then also build sort of a rudimentary base of knowledge. So, so I think we're agreed, like the, the nice middle ground is reading strategy instruction, where um, kids, kids have a working knowledge of what the heck they're reading is, is not a bad way to go. Absolutely. And they continue to build more knowledge by reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't I, I feel like I'm going to go backwards a little bit and I apologize for this I just like I have my listeners in mind and I want to make sure I feel like we often I, I even hear people say like well no that's not a skill that's a strategy this is a teach, you know, main idea is a strategy this is a skill uh, and I think we go back and forth and uh, I just like is there like is there actually a list of like these are skills and these are strategies or oh. is it more like what you said where I think Lori already asked this, but just like, yeah, and more so, like a continuum. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the, the, um, a strategy, um, and to, to go back to this article that I kind of remember from 15 years ago <laughs> is, um, that the strategy is when we mindfully and using resources apply mental effort 
to accomplish a goal. So the strategy of prediction is one where we might um, make an anticipatory frame or assumption about where a text is going. And um, in making a prediction, we then read and check the incoming information from the text to, to see if our prediction was accurate. And if it was, then we go, yay, I'm a good reader and continue <laughs> on. If not, uh, you know, then this invokes comprehension monitoring, which is its own set of strategies. Um, and we want all students to do this, but they don't do it automatically. They don't just like go to the skill, which is the supercharged, fast, automatic version of a strategy. So um, the typical student reader is going to develop strategy, 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 moving um, gradually, but sometimes quickly into a skill mode based on how well they learn it, how well it is taught, and how often the student gets to practice it and master it. Okay. Um, that's the learning part. Our teaching part is, um, we don't teach reading skills. I mean, I like that's, that's one of the points of the article that if we visualize or, um, conceptualize skills as automatic, you can't teach stuff to automatic to students. That's where we hope they get, right. but you have to teach the sort of deconstructed idea of it. And that's not a bad thing because, um, what, what that, does for us is it it lets us think about what are the steps that i must go through as a teacher to help teach the readers in my classroom what what are the strategic steps that i can get from making a prediction or synthesizing information from across four resources on the internet or if i want to get metacognitive what are the strategies that i can develop to check my understanding at the end of sentences and paragraphs things like that and those are the those are the step-by-step -step things that I, I mentioned earlier we can explain, model, and think aloud about for our students, which we know are um, really nice ways of delivering strategy instruction. Yeah. Does, so, it, does that help? Or? Yeah. And so I mean, I'm just thinking like and strategies can get more and more complex over the years. I, yeah. I just always have this list in my head of like, there's like five comprehension strategies and the, these are the, you know, and, and, and the way you're talking about it to me feels like it's any, anything that helps a reader understand <laughs> what they're reading is, is yeah. a strategy. <laughs> like yeah. you're helping, giving them another strategy. And there might be some basic like predicting and summarizing yeah. that, that they fall under, but it doesn't sound like I'm just going to, you know, come into a seventh grade class and teach them how to summarize like they've never heard the term summarize before. <laughs> right, right, right. But more yeah. it's about the the specificity of, okay, now you're in seventh grade and there's this more complex text. How do, how do we tackle that? Right, right. And again, you know, like we, David and Scott and I, when we wrote that thing back in 2008, really, you know, we, we put it out there just as a, an offering for people to think about is, is this an improvement on the way that you think about strategies and skills? And, um, you know, it's, I generally been well received and, um, it's, uh, it, it's just a, you know, like it was really a thought piece, but we've, we've, we've gotten really good feedback on it and it seems to be cited a lot, which, you know, something I used to worry about, but <laughs> don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like what we're kind of getting at is that it's less about like categorizing, whether it's a skill or a strategy and more about keeping yeah. the text and the reader at the center. And also it's kind of less about like the number, like people always ask us this question and ask on social media, like how many hours should I teach strategies and, and skills? And, you know, what's the number yeah, of hours yeah. should I teach? But what I'm hearing you say is it's less about like a specific category. It's less about a specific number of hours or time and more about the reader and them making meaning from the text and, and what they need in order to do that. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th there's all this like myth stuff around, like, like somebody's figured out, it's kind of like, do you do 10,000 steps a day? You know, like, do you, did you do 10,000 <laughs> yes. hours of strategy practice? <laughs> and there's, there's actually like people who write and say, like, if you spend 10,000 hours doing something, you'll become an expert, which is like the most mind bogglingly 
stupid thing I've ever heard. You know, like but <laughs> totally. but people actually have bestsellers that that go around. It's it's about um, how well is somebody learning something and how often can they practice it to get to the point where it's um, skillful. Um, mm-hmm. And this goes, as I said earlier, um, the using strategies can be really challenging for any type of reader, and it can be easy for other types of readers. And we, I, I guess, you know, everyone goes back to the National Reading Panel report as, uh, you know, like a blueprint for reading instruction. I'd like to point out that the stuff in that is at least a quarter of a century old, you know, and um, we've certainly learned a lot in the quarter of a century since that was published. But um, I, I like to think of decoding, you know, as an essential part of becoming a, an, an accomplished reader. That's a set of strategies. Um, and we know that um, an effective early elementary teacher is going to have kids learning all of the sound symbol correspondences effectively, um, but they're going to go through a strategy stage where they they look at a word, they don't recognize it as a sight word, and they sound it out. And then they they hope, we hope, that there's the counterpart in their listening comprehension, um, that they can match this sounded out word to something that's in their mental library. Um, but that's to me an example of where things can happen pretty quickly when when readers are learning that it goes from strategies to skill quickly um as, as you've both brought this up so i want to address it what's the, the the true number of reading strategies and i don't think that's been determined but i can tell you a few things like i read about fluency as a strategy and i i i actually think fluency is a result of being a street a strategic reader i mean str- fluency to me is a product of things working well um, because a, a student's attending, a reader is attending to prosody, intonation, ex, you know, exclamation, but also doing all of the strategic processing in a, in a very efficient manner. Um, I, I wrote a chapter with a few doctoral students a few years ago, and we looked at the popular literature. And I think the the longest list of reading strategies I could find was something like 27. And I, I was surprised because I, I thought I sort of knew the literature, but... Um, <laughs> It, I'm being snarky here, but um, <laughs> that's I think a lot might, more than I thought. <laughs> yeah, me too. And and so I I was like, what? And you know, some people say that working memory is a strategy, and um, I I was like, working memory is a thing. It's not a strategy. It's right. it's like something inside our heads. How can you call it a strategy? So th- there's still a lot of stuff that I would question, but um, you know, strategies like. Uh, I like to think about the type of reader and reading that we want our students to be engaged in and then think about what are the strategic um, mindsets that kids have to bring to that. And, you know, so that would include metacognition and metacognition for me sets a really big um, field for, for accomplished reading that you can think about prediction is, is, linked to metacognition, because once we ask kids to make predictions, we want them to monitor the accuracy of the prediction. Um, We want kids to set goals for their reading, and we can model that for them and think aloud about it, but eventually we want them to do it independently. And if you set a goal, then you want to see if you're getting towards the goal. So that comes back to being metacognitive also. Um, Summarizing is certainly an important thing. Synthesizing is really important. And then um, you know, something that I think too often is held at, off until later grades, helping kids become critical and evaluative readers um, is really important also. And my my take on that is like when we start asking kids to think about fact and opinion is that's that's a nice little strategic inroad into um, helping them become critical and evaluative readers. So. Well, I'm... I... If we have more to say about skills and strategies, we can. But I'm also interested in, you wrote a book um, that is is funny because we asked you to talk all about skills and strategies, but your book is called Teaching Readers Not Reading, Moving Beyond Skills and Strategies to Reader-Focused Instruction. So I'm just wondering if you want to talk any about that, of like, what does that mean to move beyond skills and strategies? Yeah. Well, well, thanks for asking that question. Um, So I started graduate school in the late 70s. And um, I was really fascinated with what then was like a pretty nascent uh, 
look at reading strategies, like what are they and um, what do they look and feel like? And then can we teach them? And for a number of decades, my, my research really focused on what expert readers do when reading really challenging text. And from those, I, I did what was called, uh, you know, think aloud protocols where expert readers are talking into cassette tape recorders. And for your listeners and viewers, uh, cassette tape recorder, you can go to the Smithsonian <laughs> Institution. They have an exhibit of old stuff and uh, a, a cassette, rec- you know, now you can use your phone or whatever. But these really accomplished readers would be talking into uh, the tape recorder telling me about the strategies that they were using. And so, like, I I earned my paycheck for a number of decades <laughs> doing research on on strategies and skills. And... Um, you know, at the same time, uh, teaching um, elementary reading methods courses every year, every semester with um, elementary education majors um, and visiting them in their classrooms and remembering my own teaching experience. I've, I've always known that the strategy and skill idea is only part of the equation. And I've become increasingly uh, concerned and alarmed when uh, this science of reading stuff has, you know, just taken over the um, the media and a lot of people, like powerful legislators, ideas about what's necessary for kids to learn to to be good readers. And um, I would never argue that strategies and skills are not important and are not central. But I I, I argue in this book that um, we can't ignore the other stuff that we know is really important. And this is especially so for our struggling readers. And so in, in the book, I, you know, I talk about the importance of strategy and skill, but I also go uh, where all good teachers go, which is how motivated and engaged are students. And um, is my student self-efficacious, meaning does my student believe in herself or himself or their self um, in, uh, will they be, be able to succeed when they read? And um, how metacognitive are students? Because if students are not metacognitive, when they leave our classrooms at the end of the teaching year, then how would we expect them to be independent readers if they're not able to manage it on their own? And I also go into um, mindsets and attributions and and the things that students um, build self-beliefs about reading. And each of the chapters goes to research and and a lot of this research has been done in the last quarter century since the national reading panel report that that demonstrate the influence of motivation and engagement on reading comprehension that demonstrate the influence of uh, self-efficacy or students belief in self on reading performance and that demonstrate the power of metacognition in helping kids become independent and successful strategy and skill users in reading. And so th- the book is really an argument for um, let's not let's not forget about these things that they, they always are in the background, I think, in discussions, but they's not always in the forefront. Whereas um, my read of a lot of the science of reading uh, rhetoric is, well, you know, if we get kids all set on phonics, then their lives are, are set and they'll be happy, successful readers. And I, I don't think it works that way. I, I think that, um, especially for our most struggling readers, um, if, if you're not doing well in reading, you you build an expectation of failure. You know, So this, this becomes part of the attribution story that each child develops. And um, you don't believe in yourself, so your self-efficacy is low. And you're not motivated, and so you're not engaged. And so how do, how do we expect something like pure reading instruction, which would be strategy and skill from one perspective, to be successful when we know that all of these other things have powerful influence on reading development and reading achievement? So it's um, the book is really a, it's a book length plea for us to um, pay attention to what we know through research now um, as to the power of these other factors on reading development. So I love that so much. And and it's, yeah, it's, I mean, that's, 
I, my editor at, um, at Guilford Press, who published the book, we went back and forth about the title because it's kind of an awkward title. It's called Teaching Readers, not Teaching Reading. And then there's a, you know, colon, because at academics, you always have to have a long rambling title. But um, <laughs> the, the idea is readers are these individuals who use strategies and skills and must learn them. But they're also individuals who can or may not be motivated and engaged, who may have higher or low self-efficacy, who may be um, making attributions to effort or making attributions like I'm dumb or the teacher doesn't like me. And and we have to pay attention to those. You, you look at, I, I directed two university reading clinics and uh, at Albany and the University of Maryland. And the kids who come in every year to those clinics have fairly predictable profiles when it comes to motivation and engagement, self-efficacy, attributions, and metacognition. And that profile is often they're lacking in all of those, or at least some of those. And and to think that our really effective strategy and skill instruction is going to solve the problem is, I think, short-sighted. It can be part of it because as our kids experience success with strategies and skills, they can become more motivated. They can see... Um, that their effort is leading to a, a, a good outcome. Um, they can become motivated and engaged when they read and experience success independently, those sorts of things. So, yeah, that's such a thanks good point. for letting it's, me make that little plug. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's, it's really important. And I mean, I feel like I can attest to that just myself. Um, I've spoken about it many times on this podcast and Melissa said it earlier, you know, sure. I, I used to use those con- contrived text in my classroom you know you'd take the copy the the book and you'd copy the paragraph or a couple paragraphs and then you would teach how to right. you know find cause and effect and that that paragraph or those paragraphs were specifically contrived for cause and effect <laughs> and um right, I right, didn't right. I didn't see motivation or engagement or anything increase I thought you know um if I had to remember right the places where I did see those things increase were in the content areas were in science or social studies and you know kids right. were doing experiments and they were authentically making predictions and getting excited and motivated by what we were doing um and so uh, it's just it's i i just have to circle back to what we talked about earlier it's it's really just both it's it's both and it's that building that knowledge of content areas in the world and using our strategies and explicitly teaching strategies to access all of that and um, hopefully right. getting them to the point where they're, they're really fluent in their both reading and understanding, but attending to the whole child. And I think it's awesome that you as someone who wrote a lot about skills and strategies in the past and are, you know, known for that, um, yeah. wrote this great book about attending to the whole child. That's so important as well. Well, thanks, thanks. You know, I, I, um, I just would add to that that um, we've we've been over the idea that strategy instruction in an area in which children already have knowledge is is way better than strategy instruction in an unknown content area. But um, in addition to that, that middle ground of strategy instruction in a in an area that students already know something about, um, I'm a real fan of problem based learning because that to me that that can supercharge a kid's motivation and engagement, um, their self-efficacy when they're, at, they're, they're reading not to answer comprehension questions, but to solve a problem. I mean, and, and to do things like people who are not in school do when they read, which is to enjoy oneself, to further their knowledge, to solve a problem. And, and not, um, I can't remember the last time I answered a 10 question comprehension quiz on anything I've read, you know, so... It, it was a long time ago. So. Exactly. But I still yeah. like reading. I think I'm okay. So <laughs> I think yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> we think you're okay. Well, Peter, do you have anything <laughs> else that you want? <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to just wrap up? Tell it that we didn't already touch on about skills, strategies, beyond skills and strategies. Yeah. Um, so to get back to the article, um, David Pearson, Scott Paris, and I wrote it in an attempt to clarify um, how strategies and skills are different, but also how they're related. And, um, you know, whether or not someone likes to uh, think about strategies and skills in the way that we've um, 
detailed them in that article. I think the most important thing is um, to conceptualize a strategy as a tool that a student uses to help construct meaning and, and be, be a good reader. And then um, the ideas of using a gradual release of responsibility where we see a strategy introduced that may not be known at all to a particular student. So there's the teacher is explaining, thinking aloud, modeling, and repeating that until there's some certainty that the students are starting to get it. And um, doing that strategy instruction um, in a way that honors each kid's progress. You know, like, and uh, of course, this is the the perennial challenge in a classroom. How do you meet individual differences? Um, but but doing that in the classroom, combining it with content area learning, and then remembering that uh, we don't read except in school to answer comprehension questions. We read um, to do things, to accomplish things other than the reading that we're doing. And that as our curriculum can reflect that, and as we can build in opportunities for kids to um, feel like they're making a contribution to their classmates, to society, they're solving their, their own problems, they're examining an issue that might be really relevant to their life at home or uh, an issue with a friend, th those are all things that, that matter and that can um, be catalysts for kids to become better uh, and more strategic. Um, so, so strategy and skill, we teach the strategy and we hope that through practice and mastery, the kids become skillful in those strategies. Um, sometimes our strategy and skill package is so, um, on demand because we're reading difficult material, the strategies will, will show themselves to us. Like most of us at, at our stage of reading development, are pretty proficient and we we don't think about reading strategies we just use them and we want our students to get there but they they need this vast experience in many cases to get them to this very skillful automatic application of what were once strategies so i hope i didn't confuse things there but i don't, I don't think, think you so. did oh okay, <laughs> okay. Actually, I feel like it was really helpful because I read and I was reading something a few days ago that was very challenging for me. It was uh, about metacognitive, um, not, I'm sorry, not metacognitive, meta-analysis, all these meta words, meta-analysis. Uh, and I yeah. was having to, because it was, you know, language that I'm not super familiar with and don't use on a daily basis. I was having sure. to stop after each section and ask myself, okay, what was this about? What was this about? Let me take some notes. Right. And so right. I saw those strategies coming out, but I haven't had to use them in a while. Right. You know, they're not, they don't, they don't come out all the time. Um, so I, they were yeah. there when I needed so that I, this conversation was very timely. I was reflecting on that as we were, as you were talking. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful thing about, again, um, you know, how the brain operates is like, if things are working, we don't pay attention to them. You know, like we pay attention to things when from a cognitive strategy perspective and skill perspective, when they start breaking down or we know that they're not working. And we know that because of metacognition. So, and l l one last plug for metacognition, um, yeah. you know, metacognition was not included in the national reading panel report. And it's not one of the five pillars of no child left behind. And unfortunately it is frequently left out of reading curricula but, but I'd ask this question, if, if you're not teaching metacognitive strategies, um, how could you hope that your kids will walk through the classroom door that last day of the school year and read independently and successfully if they're not metacognitive? So, um, and there, there are loads of, um, I don't think they're 27, but there's a good <laughs> number of metacognitive strategies that we can, uh, we can help children learn and, and use. Do you want to oh. share some of them? Yeah, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, well, you know, so in our, uh, in, so, in the reading clinics I've worked in, um, I mentioned this earlier, a lot of kids come in and like metacognition is an alien concept to them. You know, both, we wouldn't ask them to conceptualize it. We'd ask them to, to practice it and learn it. Um, and if, if you have a student who gives every indication of not being metacognitive, meaning you could ask them, how's your reading going? And they go, okay, it's going good. And then you ask them a question and they don't know any answers. Um, 
we start with really simple questions like, does that make sense at the end of a sentence? Do I understand? And, you know, again, it's the idea of importing what's at first an external prompt. It could be a teacher. It could be a, t a checklist or both. And once in the clinic, we see our students starting to internalize, does that make sense? Then, then they've starting to get their head wrapped around why we're reading in the first place, which is the construct meaning. And of course, those are like the little uh, acorn metacognitive questions that grow into the mighty oak of metacognitive awareness. But when you can follow, does that make sense? Um, do I understand with, is there a problem? Can I identify the problem? Um, can I fix the problem? Can I get back on track? And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I was never taught metacognitive strategies, so I'm not sure how they developed. And I think this is an important point that I haven't made earlier. It, that's me saying that I actually say things that are important. So let me, <laughs> let me step back. But um, it's, I think a lot of people become strategic and have become strategic in the past. Like if you think about monks and, you know, scribes back in the middle ages or, or in ancient Greece or Rome or in Africa or any place where literacy developed, I'm pretty sure they weren't teaching metacognitive strategies, but people became pretty good readers. I think that strategy instruction has the benefit of making more efficient our students learning. And, and I, I, I think it's, uh, a really productive way of spending school resources and time um, in doing reading strategy instruction. A lot of people can develop strategies on their own. I'm not quite sure that we know how that happens, but strategy instruction is the more direct and more efficient way to help students get there. Yeah. To your point about uh, metacognition, um, I've talked about this, I think, on a previous podcast, but not for a really long time, I don't think. I used to to teach a fitness, to teach fitness classes. And one of the fitness classes I taught was a body pump class. It's weightlifting and you can hurt yourself if you don't do it right. Uh -huh. Right. I mean, that matters. Um, sure. And so when I, when, you know, I, what you're making me think about is when we were doing, you know, if I'm, I'm standing there teaching the class, there's 35, 40 people in front of me, everybody's squatting. And you know, I'm saying like hips back, knees over toes, you know, for a good squat. Well, what always scared me is the people who came back week after week, not having any realization or awareness that they were not mm -hmm. even in the ballpark, right. Of doing us that correctly because they could get really hurt. Right. Right. So right. to me, like this metacognitive piece is like, am I aware <laughs> that there's a, an issue? Right. Am I aware that I'm not understanding what I'm reading? Am I aware that my squat over time is going to hurt my knees if I don't sit back a little further or whatever it might be. Um, and I think the part is the awareness that when our readers are, are saying, yeah, ev everything's fine. I'm doing great, but they have no idea what they read. That's where as, as teachers, we need to pause and, okay, what do I need to do for the, this student to really help them right. dig in and understand that they don't understand. And that actually it's a really right. good thing right. to know that I don't understand. That's a great thing. Right. Yeah, and then it is. what do I do yeah. about it? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I think the sports analogy is really apropos and that um, if, if we picture ourselves as teachers, as coaches, um, what we want to do is get kids to the point where when they're out on the field or, you know, on the pitch or in the court or whatever, to keep the analogy going, um, they can independently um, do the things that a coach did prior. You know, like th they bring their toolkit, which we help them build as teachers to um, eventually be independent. And, and so it's not our calling attention to like your ground stroke is way off or you're going to fall backwards and that weight's going to crush your ability to breathe, you know, or something like something drastic that usually doesn't happen in reading, but um, you know, it's, it's the same idea that the coach provides a voice of um, regulation in the case of metacognition that we want kids to eventually adopt and use themselves. And then they're independent. So. Yeah. I love that. I, lo I love sports analogies. They're, Right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of relationships I think between being a good coach and being a good teacher. So, Agreed. they're one in the same from my perspective. Yeah. 
Agree, agree. All right. Well, Peter, we'd love to wrap up today's podcast by asking you some rapid fire questions about things that you love. Uh And this, I know this may or may not be related to, uh, (laughs) to to reading. You, you can take it wherever you want to. (laughs) Sure. Okay. All right. First, uh, first question. Yeah. What do you love to read? Um, well, I'm, like three quarters Irish, even though my last name is not Irish. Um, and I, I love, I love Irish literature actually, you know, like the contemporary Irish fiction writers and, uh, classic Irish fiction writers. Um, I love, um, Alice Munro, short story writer. I love Ian McEwan, who's, uh, sometimes dark and strange British novelist. Um, I love reading the newspaper every morning. Um, all it, we, we used to call it a newspaper. Now it's online, but, uh, <laughs> but it keeps your fingers from getting all the newsprint on it. You know, and back in the old days, um, I, I like reading other researchers and theorists work. Um, cause I've, uh, well, I've spent, I've, I really spent decades at this craft and, um, I always find like my thinking gets really well influenced by others thinking and others writing. And, uh, what else do I like to read? Uh, Somehow I got, I got, I get emails from people magazine and, uh, they'll shoot me like these emails and it's about like two or three people. And I, I don't have any idea who these people are, you know, like, so (laughs) part of me is very proud that I'm so out of touch with popular culture. And part of me worries that, um, I'm really, I'm really getting defunct and, uh, yeah. That's great. But, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah, I just, I, I grew up. I went to school and I was a public school graduate in New York City. I went to uh, PS 33 and junior high school 109 and Jamaica high school in Queens. And uh, I, I grew up with the New York Times and the, the New Yorker as uh, regular things in my household. And, you know, of course, this is leads to a pitch for, you know, if you grow up in a household where people read and model reading and value reading, it's it's almost inevitable that you'll become a pretty decent reader. Um, but we have to remember that for our struggling readers that, um, that might not be going on in some houses and the literacy that's practiced in some, some households and communities is not a good match with, um, the literacy that's expected of kids coming into school. So other things like, I like to read street signs when I'm lost. Um, (laughs) I like to read wine labels to see if the person who wrote the wine label is tasting the same, you know, like. Uh, I'm getting pear, I'm getting persimmon, I'm getting wet river stone. And as one of my daughters said, do people actually like lick a wet river stone to come up with that? I know, so. I know. <laughs> those are always funny. Yeah. I love it. All right. So and I have I, another question. Th- for those you. are the oh. things I like to read. Yeah. Okay. One sure, more. Ready? Sure. All right. What do you yeah. love to watch? Okay, so I just I just got off a flight at midnight last night from uh, Italy, and it was a long flight. And uh, I watch I rewatch Ted Lasso. Uh, I oh, think yeah. um, I got I got Lori to watch Ted Lasso. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, you know because we, we were just talking about coaching, and uh, you know, like mm-hmm. even though it's a comedy and it's it's kind of a ridiculous premise, um, the the character of Ted Lasso is one who is a coach who is enabling in a, in the best sense of the word, who is supportive, and um, who is judgmental but not in a, a nasty way. Um, mm-hmm. He's judgmental in ways that can be productive for his teammates. And um, what else do I watch? Uh, yeah, I, I watch more movies than TV because I figure if I, I'm watching TV, I have to come back to every episode, whereas <laughs> movies done, you know, after an hour and a half or two hours. So, um, yeah, I did. I, I got to put in a pitch for this. The best movie I saw. Well, I saw a lot of good movies. One was uh, Women Talking was was a really wonderful movie. And then a movie about a donkey called E.O., just the letter E and the letter O. And it was uh, a nomination for best film, foreign film from uh, Poland. And it's it's about life across a couple of weeks from the perspective of a donkey. And huh. it's <laughs> it's uh, it's charming, upsetting, and I thought really engaging. So, yeah. 
Yeah, we'll have so. to find that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One last question. Oh, okay. Why do you do what you love for education? Um, well, so, um, education's in my family DNA. Like, well, my mom was a librarian in New York city public schools and my older sister is a retired special education teacher in Massachusetts. And my younger brother was a history teacher in New York and, um, teaching just seemed to be, you know, part of how I thought about life. And, uh, I, well, specific to reading, you know, like I've always thought reading's like the best invention ever. Like, um, it's better than, um, soda stream. I think it's better <laughs> than, um, a cell phone. You know, it's, it's just, to me, it's like w one of the most amazing human accomplishments. And, and I, you know, I, I think I figured out early on, like if you're successful in all school subjects, you have to be successful in reading um, to start off. And so um, that might be a good place to um, think about creating a career. And I taught, um, I was a remedial reading teacher in junior high school um, in upstate New York in Saratoga Springs. And that was the hardest job I ever had because, you know, junior high school students in general are not my cup of tea, as they say. <laughs> but, but you know, a, a struggling seventh, eighth, and ninth grader is someone who's faced a lot of failure and has usually has really diminished self-esteem and self-efficacy. And I was a chapter one K through six reading teacher. And so when I went back to get my master's and then my PhD, those experiences really influenced the, the choice of things that I wanted to do. Because I, I felt like I was so privileged growing up to not have to worry about learning to read. It just happened a combination of, of factors. Um, that I think, you know, reading's a basic human right. And so uh, being able to do what I hope is some productive work in that area has been very, uh, it's very, been very personally rewarding. So. Well, thank you for your work and for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Oh, I really sure. appreciate it. Sure. Well, it's it's great to get to know you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I hope there's something worthwhile in this hour. So, absolutely. <laughs> okay.